Hello, this is our seventh lecture. In this, I'll be presenting some thoughts on the organizational practices in the human service organizations, and also reviewing um, um, uh, reviewing issues and uh, which are, which are central to organizational characteristics and the structure itself. And um, largely, we base this on um, Johnson May, and hopefully, we will get through this lecture in probably about 40 minutes or so. And uh, if there are any uh, issues and concerns that you have or questions that you wish to raise, you can uh, certainly send them over to me by email and uh, or even raise them in the, uh, in the forum so that we could um, talk through them. Right, when we want to look at the overview of this particular topic, it is to provide us an understanding of the organization structure. What does it entail? What does an organizational structure mean? Is that just an organizational chart? What would that look like? And uh, what are the kind of roles of people? What are the functions that they tend to do? what probably is the influence that an organization may have across some of these factors we've already considered in the previous uh, lectures, like organizations, basically human service organizations, deal with um, a number of issues and concerns, and uh, they are also, in a way, relate themselves to market forces, relate themselves to the politics of the world, within the country in a way, and uh, respond to various community and uh, social needs which are put up by different uh, parties. So let's look at various other things that can also come up in an organization. Organizations need to do and to have a fair, uh, fair deal of record keeping as to who do they serve whom do they serve and uh, what is a quantum of services that they do. And uh, there has to be some notes and records that everybody has to maintain. And these are some of the basic characteristics of an organization. Certainly some of these aspects will require, um, you know, detailed lectures, which they will have, you know, as in the, in the course of our time, in the course of our uh, rest of the semester. This basic lecture helps us to get in and through that very structure that we are talking about. As a result, we go beyond simply comprehending and describing various facets of an organization. Uh, for some of the slides that I've used here, I wish to be, uh, I wish to gratefully acknowledge my predecessors. I wish I knew their names, but unfortunately they are not there and uh, the lecturers of the CQU. And uh, let's move on to the rest of the slides. Right, organizational structure can be defined as the formal arrangement of an organization. That is how the activities of the organization are formally set up in a hierarchy of authority and responsibility. That's a nice, uh, definition from another book, Ozon, Ozan and uh, Rose. You can have a look at that if you can get hold of it. Now, what are the components of organization structure? I think this holds clear, clearer image and uh, you know gives us a perspective as to what those are. Jones and May suggest organization structure to broadly comprise of roles, relations, rules within an organization and records. Roles, roles would mean what, what kind of a role do you play? Social worker at the grassroots, a team leader at the mid-level management, or maybe a, uh, even sometimes, you know, when we use the word mid-management and uh, uh, higher management and these kind of words, it all depends upon the largeness uh, the, the, the size of the organization. If you take a federal organization, federal government organization, certainly it would have some branches in the state 
and it might have also regional branches, etc. And if you take a state organization, it might have regional branches in different uh, parts within the state. If, it, if you take a city organization, it might have uh, you know, some um, offices in, uh, in various suburbs. So this is how you can define the reach of the organization. And that is how the structure of the organization will also be um, looked at. Certainly in relation to that is also the question of what roles people play, what is the kind of relationship between the regional office and the head office, do the regional office have their own budget, do the regional offices make their own uh, uh, decisions, or uh, are they influenced by regional decisions, how do they convey some regional priorities to the higher level, all these questions will depend upon the kind of uh, client systems that they serve and the client of resources that they have and the kind of mandate and program that they have. For instance, uh, um, if it is a regional organization, which is, uh, I mean, if it is an organization which is meant for uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities, and uh, let's assume in a particular area, you don't have many of them, but in some other area, you do have a whole, in a, in a, in a geography, in one geography, you might find more of them and the other, you might find less of them. And then certainly the budgetary constraints uh, or budgetary rehash that could happen um, can easily be seen and um, uh, accepted. Say for instance, we might turn more uh, budget, more items towards the clients who are, uh, you know, uh, in in higher numbers in a, in a, in a particular region in comparison to a small number of them in um, in another regional base. So that's how we tend to look at the organizations and their uh, structures. Now, what happens in an organization structure? One of the things that happens is there's a formal process. Most of these formal processes are related to reporting. Who do I report to? Who do I show my work to? Who do I, whom am I accountable to? Certainly at the organization level, you are accountable to everybody, but uh, you are definitely accountable and answerable to your uh, immediate line manager, team leader, or area manager that you might have. So the hierarchy and the span of control, as I call it, is basically specified in an organization. The next one is about the design systems for communication. How do you communicate? Can I just go off and say, hi, uh, general manager, I want to talk to you. You can, certainly. You know, in corridor, you can talk to him. If he says hello, you can say hello. We are quite a polite uh, um, you know, organ, you know, organizing from, from human service organizations. We are very polite, casual, and uh, are obviously wanting to hear what the grassroots say. But, you know, suddenly you can't just go to the very high level and say, look, uh, I've got a client issue. Do you mind if I talk to? Then the person might actually tell you, do you mind actually talking to your team leader? Who's your team leader? Amanda? Yeah, go ahead and talk to Amanda. That's all the suggestion he might actually give you. The reason is he is about the big picture and you might be about the immediate issue or the immediate attention that you've got about um, the local issue or the small picture. So there's a big difference between a big picture orientation and the small picture orientation. It doesn't mean that people who are who see the big picture don't have a clue about the small picture, they do. But what happens is, how is it intensified in their horizon? How is it that it is uh, talked about and uh, advocated to them? For instance, if there are a number of niggles, number of issues, number of concerns associated with one particular client family, and uh, there are concerns uh, that the person has even taken them to a member of parliament or a local parliamentarian, then certainly it might even come from the top to the general manager 
saying that, hey, this is a person in your constituency. Can you have a look at it? Can you look at some of the, those issues? At that point of time, straight away from a top-down perspective, communication goes down to give a dossier or uh, give a briefing as to what the client issues are. In addition to that, there are some times, even without ministerials and without even parliamentary proceedings and things like that, some client issues can even get uh, ac you know, accentuated. They can be uh, put up to higher levels on the basis of prior priorities, on the basis of the need on the basis of the complexity. So that's how it goes up as well as it can come down. So the design systems for communication and coordination are there to facilitate and they are available to integrate various components across all departments. And what are the departments? Finance is one department, human resources is another department, planning would be another department, and uh, reporting, of course, you know, trying to see where the budgets are, trying to bid for budgets, all those issues are, are all those concerns become departmentalized and they also become, they become the subject matter for some of these uh, departments. So the organizational structures also have, um, they also group people. For instance, you don't sit always next to an IT person. If you are a team member, if you're a small organization, maybe an IT person, yourself, receptionist, social worker, physiotherapist, all of them might still be sitting together. But if you're a large organization, there will be an IT people who are looking after the IT. The team which is looking after, looking after a particular client might be um, you know, a, a children's and adolescent team, or there could be an adult's team, there could be uh, a team which is connected with uh, um, outreach. So those are the kind of words that we utilize in community organizations, which will obviously tell you where you sit, how you are grouped. So you could be a transdisciplinary group, you could be an interdisciplinary group, or you could even be a bunch of community organization, organizers, support coordinators, support workers. And that's a kind of uh, terminology that we can look at. So these are the ways by which, again, um, the authors have uh, explained to us. So uh, an organization chart, you know, on the top I've given an organization chart. That's the kind of look that you would always have. And uh, it's uh, it expresses vertical and horizontal structure within the organization, as well as how the various parts interrelate and come together. So what do the organizational charts do? They depict the various positions in the organization. Who's the general manager? Where does he sit? And who are the other managers? Who do they report to? What else happens underneath them? Sometimes organizational charts are so are detailed that they can go right up to the community. Johnson may contend that organization charts cannot capture the entirety of the organizational structure and suggest structure is not static, but dynamic and interactive. I think that's a very, very valid point, what Johnson may say. Surely, a chart cannot fix everything. A chart cannot express everything because there's always a dynamism in an organization. There's always interaction in an organization. And uh, there are uh, things that keep on coming up. At the same time, you cannot have an organization without an organizational chart. Because there has to be some structure. That structure can provide a certain amount of laxity, elasticity, for new structures to emerge temporarily. Look, I mean, if we, let's say uh, a, a team of uh, a, a team in um, in an organization which is dealing with youth and uh, you know children and adolescents decide to take all these young people for a day picnic, so what happens? There's a new limited functional organizational chart that can emerge. 
a work related chart that can emerge who's in charge who's going to do the food who's going to do the clean up who's going to do this who's going to mind the kids who's going to mind activities for the kids who's going to see that uh, you know someone probably you know how, who is going to look at the behavioral issues and who's going to record all these things so there's going to be a, a new emerging um, chart which is associated with an activity so you will you will be always making up some of these things but the overarching hierarchy overarching chart is something that obviously helps you to guide so certainly the non static elements and the dynamic elements that jones does talk about can be taken care of within the premises that an organizational chart has some thoughts on structural organizational analysis should organizational design represent uh, should organizational designs represent the core values and express the activities including how tasks or jobs are specialized and grouped and coordinated that's a question or should structural analysis consider both the official and operative structure of the organization why not organizations represent the core values surely and could we just then start manufacturing all those organization chart with those core values you could depends upon how many of them you could put i mean you can't put the core values i mean if the core values need to be converted into programs and if they are very very specific you could actually say the aboriginal in aboriginal and torres strait islander programs um you know child and adolescent programs with the multicultural youth depends upon what you would like to do and it is quite possible for you to do an operative um a uh, version of the organizational chart as well um uh, johnson may offer an alternative way of understanding organizational structure they talk about levels of formality how formal individual relationships are is there a complexity in the organization is there a centralization of leadership within the organization these are some of the things that they take into consideration especially in uh, their chapter 6 they also provide an overview on how the ecological perspective on organizational life can be helpful to structural analysis in understanding organizations in other words they are talking about no organization is static every organization evolves and that's a fundamental lesson that we learned in the very early stages that human service organizations are basically evolving some more thoughts on structural organization analysis while typologies and characteristics are helpful structural analysis jones and may argue organizations have their own distinct structures and influences of internal technological and environmental factors i think that's a fair comment that every organization has a distinctive flavor of its own uh, a distinctive environmental factors force that organization to serve in a particular location or locality the strategic use of structure when we come down to structural analysis that's used to inform and guide action sure students should have a good understanding of jones and may's different points for action and the nature of power relations and structure now i think that's very well expressed in uh, uh one of the tables in the book i think it's uh, 6.2 uh working in and through the structure and then building and modifying structure and uh, bending and side stepping the structure how do you confront confront and conflict uh management within the structure and creating alternative structures themselves 
So what roles one can play in working in and through structure? The roles obviously expect you to understand organizational expectations of workers and of others. The rules that we play with are know the rules, develop skills in the role, interpretation of those rules and application of those rules. So each of them see very, very clearly uh, explains in the earliest, you know, the, all these, uh, particularly 6.2 in the strategic use of structure diagram of Jones and May explains to us the roles, the rules, the relationships and the relationship finally with the record structure. So are we in a position to create uh, open records, transparent records? Do we have equitable practices within the organization? Uh, is, does our design in the organization reflect and promote desired relationships? Do we have personalized roles, some kind of an equalizing roles? Is there a minimizing opportunity in, in relation to the distinctions that are present within the organization? Some of these are the questions that are basically dealt with. So the key discussion points are, whenever possible, obtain an organizational chart of an organization you are particularly interested in. What does that chart tell you about the structure of the organization? It would be good to analyze your chart using Jones and May's concept of complexity, formalization, and centralization. Is there an additional information do you need that is not apparent in the chart and where do you get it? So sometimes it'll be the notes behind, behind the chart. Maybe it could be the executive CEO's uh, uh, you know, introduction to the whole thing, or maybe some you know, pretty pictures that are also in the annual report, which talk to the activities. Identify, try to identify one classical organic an alternative organization that services perhaps in your local region at some point of time, and uh, try and see what principal differences and similarities between their structures. I know uh, you're not going to do it right now, but over a period of time, these are some of the activities that you can uh, look at. So there are some references for this topic that have been given here, largely Jones and May's chapters and a couple of other references which I've already quoted to you. And um, we are in the seventh lecture, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in another lecture or two, we will start getting into the um, organizational analysis and particularly the case studies. Look forward to talking to you once again. Thank you.